So the, the title of the talk is Wakanda and Beyond, How to Use tech, uh, Technology for Culturally Relevant Pedagogy. It, it's rooted in this, uh, this excitement that emerged in the cultural ethos that was this phenomenon called the Black Panther movie. And so there was something intriguing about it. And not, it was not that it was just a superhero, but people were in love that the most preeminent and groundbreaking technology emerged from people of color. And so I think there's an irony here. There's a simple if that this study is rooted in. So if we are developing technology, wouldn't it matter that the technology looks and sounds like the people who, who it can serve? The challenge is people in the room who are creating that technology lack the diversity to speak to the people in communities that they're unfamiliar with. Now, we, can we blame them for that? I'll leave that as a rhetorical question. But the, the issue is, as we move forward, we need to think critically about what technology can do to bridge the gaps. And here's the sell today. I'm arguing this. We use culture, I mean, we use virtual reality in this way. We say we have these wonderful places that will take students. I can take you to the Andes. I can take you to Peru. But what if we can take you into your neighborhood and allow you to see your neighborhood differently? What if we can take you into your grocery store and you see not only the phenomenon of osmosis, but how food health issues and, are, and social justice issues associated to the food available to you, they live in your grocery store. So the, the, the if question for us is if we can teach using technology and technology as a tool, how can we enhance that tool to allow people to see their neighborhood differently? So I want to start by thanking the Telos uh, organization for, for funding this project. We were excited to do something new and you, you helped uh, this incredible team of people who are suffering long, I have to tell you. Uh, we are doing an uh, a, a interesting project and it's been uh, challenging, so I just wanted to, to recognize Catherine Rebai, uh, Gracias Perez Yoko, Dr. Philip Boda, who's our postdoc, Catherine Lemmy, Matt Wilsey, and Xavier Monroe for working on this project. So I want to start with the premise, and the premise is this. We're engaged in a revolution, it's already happened. How many of you remember these things, right? We went from this, which was a phone, to this, which is everything but a phone. Uh, I, I read a recent study that we do everything but call people on our smartphones. So the argument is that at some point, there was a shift in culture that was enabled by the technology. Uh, how many member, people remember this? This, for those of you who don't know, is a taxi cab. Many of us used to take them when we needed to go places. Right? And suddenly a revolution happened and it was replaced by Uber and Lyft and these digital services that did two things. The technology enabled culture to change. Right? So I want to show you this amazing place called the classroom. And it's known for roles and it's also known for one pe person talking and that person being the teacher. And let me show you what the modern classroom looks like. Uh, unfortunately, I went too fast, dropped the punchline. All right, here we go. Come on, technology. I believe in you. There it is, right? Uh, a contemporary classroom shares the, the same fundamental characteristics of a historical classroom. Now, if we have handheld computers in our hand, if information is readily available, why would the teacher need to disseminate information and provide all the explanations? When we know exp explaining and getting ideas wrong is paramount to gaining understanding. And each student walks into a classroom with a with a computer that is much more potent than the computer I had in college in, in their hand. Right? So the, the thought is, we've encountered a digital revolution, but the technology and the pedagogy used for that technology has not matched this revolution. So <clears throat> I, I want to argue that when kids need information, they, they, they do something very different. Uh, there was a time when we valued the person who, who, who knew all the facts. If a person knew lots of information, you gained a great cultural status. Now, we don't leave questions in the gray area of I don't know. Maybe I'll look it up. Libraries are, are, are less useful. People spend time identifying and verifying fact checking through digital information. The irony now is that there is more false information available than ever before, even despite the readily available access to technology. So the premise that I'm working on is this, is when, when embedded in a community, this community, that is rooted in innovation. How does our, our science education teaching practices reflect this innovation? So I am um, not a STEM expert. I'm purely a science expert. I don't speak on mathematics ever. Uh, I rarely touch engineering. I stay in a very narrow lane of science. And so the question that emerged for me was, could we teach science better with this innovative technology that is virtual reality? And secondly, how can technology improve our teaching practices? The real focus on teaching, right? Not that the, 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 the the, the software itself is powerful, 
but could it pr produce excellence in teaching? So we have a producer-consumer paradox. And in educational technology, uh, I'm from Oakland, California, which is a city that has its roots in, in black and brown culture. And when I, when I go to schools in Oakland, which I work in regularly, is there is a great deal of technology available to the students in the community, but very little of that technology reflects the culture of the community. Right? Uh, there's an equitable access to school-based technology. Here's what I mean by that. There are bandwidth limitations uh, in urban schools that I, have, uh, that I have found to be just fundamentally undermining of the access and use of the technology itself. And finally, we have a missed opportunity. We do, we do something profound to teachers. We say, we want you to solve the problems of the world in a day. We want you to solve issues of poverty. We want you to solve issues of inequality. We want you to solve issues of inequitable access to technology in your classroom. And we want you, as a person who is not from the community that you teach in, to truly understand all 35 students, their culture, and do that today. It is a daunting task for any teacher. The, the challenge is, how do we use technology as a cultural media, mediator? I'm arguing that we have missed an opportunity. And so as students can produce their own technology, communities can produce their own technology, we should be providing teachers with culturally relevant resources that come in the form of technology and enable them to understand the students that they're working with. So, and, and moving towards the study, I, I want to point out uh, there's a, a great deal of work around best practices in learning that needs to translate to best practices in technology. So this comes from the work of Brenda Fonseca and Mickey Chi in the handbook, handbook for Multimedia Learning. And they did a, a meta-analysis of years of studies on teaching and learning. They argue this, is that the least effective learning mechanism of learning is passive instruction. It's what you're doing right now. I'm blabbering. You're sitting. You're doing nothing. I'm blabbering. That is the least efficient. Right? A higher version of that is active learning, where I'm offering an idea. What you're doing to that idea is you're listening, you're annotating. But you're just copying notes. You're, you're not producing anything novel. The third in this hierarchy is constructive application of ideas. And so if I teach an idea, you take that and you produce your own explanation. You, you, you put it in your own voice. You provide your own application. And on, on, the, on the highest level of their framework is that interactive and social framings are the most efficient mechanism for learning. And their argument is this, is that if the team of us have to make sense of an idea and construct it together, then the team of us will have a more nuanced understanding. And it's rooted in Gene Lay's work on situated cognition, is that collectively, we gain understanding through the need to communicate. So what does that mean? That means our most prominent technologies, if you take a look here, 1.2 million views, we are simply replicating the least efficient mode of digital learning, where a voice is blabbering. It's a digital voice, but it is still a voice. If explanation produces understanding, and we need students to explain, interpret, and offer ideas, then it's paramount that our technology provides them access to do that. So <clears throat> I want to focus now and shift towards STEM learning in particular. So we're focused on, on science learning. Part of the, the challenge with science learning is that we're dealing with abstract phenomena. When you are thinking about uh, atomic structure, what you're, what you're really interacting with is models that represent where electrons could possibly be at any particular moment. And when teaching an idea, you may get five different versions of models as a means to teach you an idea. So we're arguing that. Uh, Technology and science education has to use technology to enhance understanding. Uh, and we're adopting Richard Mayer's framework. We're going to add a layer to it. So Richard Mayer wrote the handbook for multimedia learning and the handbook for learning. He's a professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And his framework for multimedia learning suggests that we really only have two resources regardless of, if, of the resource. If we're talking about AI or if we're talking about virtual reality, all we're doing is providing access to words and pictures. Right? And so those pictures and words are incorporated by our eyes and ears. Now, here's what's important, is through our sensory memory, our working memory selects the things that have meaning, and then we can incorporate it with the things that we already know. We're developing cognitive schema and pictures and models around things that we already integrated with. So for us, here's the problem. The problem is the pictures and words that we have access to are all rooted in the context in which those words have meaning. So for example, I can walk in a room and I can teach a person about osmosis and I can tell you the story of how water moves across a semipermeable membrane, right? That lacks the cultural framing so that a person might see it every day. Or I can teach you about how marinating carne asada relies on osmosis for the water to move across the membrane in order to marinate the meat. 
right? Because in order for marination to occur, water and seasoning must be moving at some point. The likelihood that a person experiences that phenomena multiple times should suggest that they would understand and learn it greater, right? So what we're saying is, if we're going to connect to prior knowledge, then we need to teach in a culture that the students might experience. And where that becomes especially valuable is in a digital world. If we can provide a new way to see the digital phenomena, students have a greater opportunities to learn. So three scales that we think are valuable in science education for virtual reality. The first is micro. Is that I mentioned before, we're looking at scientific phenomena. We need to get inside of an, an atom. Well, a great benefit of VR is I can take you inside of an atom. Another is meso. I can take you to places that there is no way you could possibly go. You can do that through virtual reality. And another is macro, is one of the challenges in understanding things like environmental science is you need, issue, you need to imagine the scale in which we're talking about things. And so meso perspective and technology help as well. So I'm going to give you some quick examples. So here's what. All right, my links are not working. I'm going to go here. So here's what a micro framework would look like in virtual reality. Here's, here's a virtual reality version body is made of up cells. About 40 trillion of these cells. It's not As on the screen. See, All right. The cell is a dynamic place. There are a lot of different things happening at the same time. Look around and check out the environment. Turn to the sides and look all the way behind you. Tilt your head back and look above you. I'll turn the, and this, look down the image below. off. So what, what you're the able to see. If actually looked like this, you'd be tiny, about 100 nanometers tall, which means that about 3,000 of you stacked on top of each other. You can see the Golgi apparatus here. You can actually venture sand. into the cell, Most and the, the narrative of, of what's happening at the micro level becomes clear. I'll give you like another version with the, the, the image is much brighter. Let's talk about adaptations. So what if our lesson on adaptations takes you into the, in the jungle? Uh, probably not the place, safest place to be is uh, next to primates at this level, but virtual reality provides you uh, an ac access to, to be taken anywhere that someone's gone with a VR360 camera. And so there, there's access at a meso level in ways that are quite resourceful and useful. At a macro level, we talked about scale. trip to space, although Elon Musk is trying to make it less expensive, is, uh, is certainly quite difficult. And what VR enables us to do is to get a sense of scale. placed uh, VR360 cameras on satellites and being able to capture meteor showers. And so instead of being told about, about meteor showers and uh, how things are broken up as they enter the atmosphere, you can actually see them. And it's, all of this is free on YouTube. So I want to move quickly, because I know I'm running short on time here, to, to the, the heart of the, the actual research that we're doing. And, and the, the first place to start is to talk about where are we in the, in the field? Uh, I find that the current state of affairs for, for virtual reality research is very limited in its imp application for school-based science. Very little research has actually studied how w virtual reality could benefit teaching and learning in the schools. And there are uh, essentially three paradigms. The first paradigm of research is there's a set of studies that, that do document learning. And they've all uniformly found that learning v using VR enhances student learning. Now, the, the, the heart of that work is rooted in comparing simulations versus 3D. And so uh, Moreno and Mayer, in their 2002 study, uh, they looked at if students were watching videos versus being immersed in the VR world where they retain information, they found statistically significant positive results. Uh, in a recent study by Jimenez, they wanted to study if it had an apathetic or an impact on a student's sense of, sense of empathy and misery when they're dealing with cancer. So he took uh, breast cancer patients, and they were taught in two ways. One group had virtual reality instruction about uh, how the cancer would be treated, the, the types of radiation, 
and um, <clears throat> uh, and and um, I'm trying to think of the other treatment. It was chemotherapy, chemotherapy and radiation treatment. So they understood the process. Uh, one group got video, one group got VR, and what, what they found was that there was no difference in their emotional response, but the students who were taught using VR retained the information and had more accurate information in the long haul. So there were positive implications there. Um, what, what are then available are studies about, about process, and so many of those studies documented how in process they're finding that VR is, a, is, is helpful for helping people understand uh, the community of learning. I'm, I'm short on time, so I want to get to the study. So our, our study op operates in the framework of, of situated cognition, that if I put you in a situation where the knowledge is meaningful, that that knowledge would, uh, would help you understand long term. And so we're arguing that culture relevant pedagogy, where we teach in the context of culture, it does that. So what we did was this, is, <clears throat> excuse me, We did, we're, we're involved in two studies. The first study is a study of whether or not culture relevant instruction, virtual reality, had an impact on students' understanding of how the phenomena impacted culture. And so we had three school sites. Each of the school sites were given a pre-survey and a post-survey and were interviewed. And what we were, what we were exploring was in one lesson on virtual reality. Could we see if students were taught about the, the concept was uh, food chains, Thought, taught through a scenario where we take them into a barbershop and we ask them should people in their community be eating flaming hot Cheetos, right? So the lesson was about uh, the, a debate about flaming hot Cheetos. And then we, we taught them about how uh, unhealthy food options lead to diabetes and how there was an economy for uh, treating people in diabetes in their community. And the way we did that is we drove them through their neighborhood and we had them count the number of fast food restaurants, and we overlaid a map of all the diabetes centers in their community. So in teaching about food chains, we drew a correlation to this implication on community. Okay. We use a four constructs for our study. Uh, the first is four questions, uh, the questions about understanding the relationship of science. So these were how people should, these are, uh, how people should continue to learn science. What was the true benefit of science? So there are questions about understanding science. Community and science questions. And so these were questions about how science actually is a benefit to their community. There were science and me communities questions. And so these were questions both in survey and interview uh, about how science was useful in their lives. And lastly, about the process of science. How does science impact students' decision making? And so in pre and post survey, uh, you, you'll notice that um, we have a few significant items, and the first is that uh, we saw a connection between science. And so on items that are science and me, we saw a positive movement in students' conception of how science is important to them and how they viewed science as, as valuable. Uh, where we saw greatest significance is understanding the process of science and how the process of science was important. And our, our biggest differences were in this, this construct of how the science in the community, how science was a valued asset to the community. So by taking them into the community and teaching them science in the concept of the community, what we found was students drew a deeper connection to how science was a valuable entity and something that they needed to study. Uh, we, we followed that with interviews. And so just this is our total population. And this is the interview subsample that we did of 30% of the, the total number of students. And I um, want to make sure I close on time and we'll give you a sense of what we discovered. So what we found in our initial analysis is that they talked about uh, science in a number of ways and their experience learning VR. And the first is that they talked about the learning curve associated with VR learning, how it, it was difficult to actually learn how to use the VR devices. Uh, we talked about science learning. And then this particular issue is where we did our secondary analysis. They then talked about social justice. So how are issues of science associated with, with health and social justice? And so we did a, a sub-analysis of, of this discussion. And we found that they, they started talking about science in three particular ways. The first is that they talked about health justice. And, and as an example, Brenda said this. She said, this lesson was connected to my community because there's lots of people in my community that eat unhealthily, and I kind of want to help them so that they can eat healthier. So we found that one of the patterns that emerged was students talk about how, the, how science was connected to an a, a issue of health justice in their community. There's also economic justice. And here's a, an example from Ronaldo. Ronaldo, uh, he explained, there are advantages for stores. The advantage for the stores is the money or the, the government for the money. And we found this pattern where students talked about providing people unhealthy food and then providing uh, medical services in the same community 
was an issue of economic injustice. And then finally, there was issues of environmental justice. Um, Aaron shared this. He said, well, if people keep buying plastic from junk foods, they could throw it into the sea and damage the birds. And so there was also this connection between how science is taught in the context of their community and how there's also an environmental issue. So in, in moving to close, uh, I'm, I'm short on time, so I'll, I'll, I'll close with this. Um, the first thing I want to point out is that there's a huge potential here. Um, the, and the potential is that VR has the potential to communicate both cognitive and affective messages at the same time. Here's what I mean by that. So if I'm taught and I'm immersed in a, in a, in a jungle and I'm talking about uh, issues of environmental health and environmental justice, I can have any voice as a subtext. I can have any music as a subtext. Is if students are constantly sent messages that science is not for me, virtual reality enables us to send an opposite message. And as teachers are constantly struggling to find ways to convince students that science is for them, is we can use the technology to send that message subtly. The second is a modern approach to VR te technology has to consider how gender, race, and culture can provide messages of access. So for example, shifting the consumer producer paradox where we have women offering instruction in this digital space sends a separate message. And so when we start to think about the psychological barriers between can I pursue physics or can I pursue, pursue chemistry, is that virtual reality provides us an opportunity to provide not only content, but access to cultural mechanisms that really can serve as a bridge. And, and in closing, I, I want to make a, a, a final sale. And here's the final sale. Is in, in my eyes, virtual reality has the potential to bridge culture, cultural gaps if we shift our current framework from one that everybody in, in urban communities are merely consumers of virtual reality technology towards a, a framework that enables us to see people in communities as cultural knowledge producers. And finally, it's really time to re revisit this paradox. And so what we found in the last six months is Apple uh, re finally came to the, to the table for VR360 and VR Worlds. You can now edit in uh, Final Cut and Apple is finally uh, enabling its consumers to do things on the cheap. But when we started this project, you couldn't do it. And so what we're finding is that it's becoming cheaper and easier for people to do uh, both VR 360 and VR Worlds as Unity and uh, Final Cut are, are providing access to technology builders. And so I just want to thank you for your time and uh, look forward to brief question and answers.